Hello to everyone. Our live Facebook conference are back this night with another event. Uh, I think is our second event in English, but is our first with uh, someone that is outside of Romania. And uh, we are proud to, to have him. He's one of our friends and colleagues and partners. And uh, we would really like to uh, hear him and learn about his experience, um, the way uh, they uh, uh, tried to overcome the challenges that they have by planting in different areas, not only in, uh, in Spain. So without further ado, I'll pass the, the mic to say to, to Mihai to present our guest tonight. And all of you, if you have questions, please ask them. We will be monitoring our Facebook chat and uh, reply to all of you gladly. Mihai? Thank you, Marin. If I may add, you said that Sven is outside from Romania. But I know that Sven already knows very well our country because he participated at least to two or three planting campaigns last year in our country. So we traveled together across Romania and he saw a different type of forest. But this is not the main idea for tonight. The main idea is that uh, our guest, Sven Kallen from Life Terra, will give us a short presentation about their project which is implemented in several countries across Europe. So Sven, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mihai and Marin, for the introduction and for the invitation, of course. Very excited to participate with you guys and the audience. It is, to be very honest, my first Facebook um, conference or webinar, whatever you want to call it. So uh, <laughs> I hope everything works. I'm currently in Barcelona, Spain, uh, but we work across all of Europe, as Mihai said. And uh, indeed, it is one of the big pleasures of our project to be able to meet new people across Europe and particularly welcome always in Romania, where um, there's been eye seeing some eye-opening projects. You guys are doing a fantastic job with restoring nature. So, um, as said, we are a European initiative and I would like to you know, give a little bit of background of why we started, why I started this and how we try to get involvement of citizens because I feel that uh, perhaps governments are sometimes a little bit slow in pushing climate action. So we as citizens, as students, as professionals, as companies, we can really try and move this forward and show that uh, together we can really reach some um, some change. Okay, so here we go. First off, let's see if this works. Why did I start this, uh, this movement that we're trying to build? So um, some of you are maybe familiar with this graph. It basically um, is tracking, it's a weather station in uh, in Hawaii, in uh, Mauna Loa, it's one of these beautiful islands, and they've been tracking since the 60s um, the concentration of carbon dioxide particles in the air. And the graph, as you can see in blue, is pretty astonishing. It's very, very straight and very consistent in the amount of um, PPM over the years. And it continues growing. This is already uh, a little bit old. You see that it's, uh, we are really reaching 400 and more and higher PPMs. At the same time, they're also tracking the average temperatures of land and the ocean and the acidity, which is an indicator of um, the status of the, of the ocean. So if you see at these big trends and um, read a little bit about the IPCC reports on climate change and the impacts that it can have. I think it's a pretty uh, impactful assessment where you're definitely heading as a world in, in the wrong direction. And so what can we do about it, right? I mean, there's a lot of phenomena that it can that it can help, uh, that it can um, sort of uh, 
reach or impact with potentially very, very bad results. This is a more recently um, graph on the on the growth of the CO2 um, concentration, and you see that it's it's really very much very straight line up, only ways up so far. Now, I think that um, last summer has been and, and autumn has been particularly um, strong in terms of reporting in the media on all these effects we had long periods of droughts all across Europe. I mean, I'm living in Spain right now. I'm from the Netherlands, where originally where we have always had a problem of too much water, but even in the Netherlands we had the soil cracking and drying out. We had some forest fires, of course, a lot around Spain, Portugal, in the UK, um, in Romania, in several other countries. And then afterwards came the rain that didn't come in the summer, fell in, in autumn altogether in one or two days, creating floodings. So you have these all the time more and more extreme weather patterns that are probably going to be the what they call the new normal. And of course, um, if you look at that from sort of a global perspective, and first we had the COVID. This is a famous cartoon that I always think about when I when I when you you, you talk about these issues. That you know, it was it was the our health situation, and which was very important, of course, with long impact on society. Then the following recession, and then people talk about climate change, and then sometimes we even forgot forget that we also have a biodiversity collapse that is also nearing. We have a huge number of species that are on the verge of dying out and this biodiversity plays an essential role in the sort of the dynamics of our ecosystem and and how all these things are connected to each other there's a lot of high interactivity between species both plants and and um, and animals so we somehow would have to restore this in order to prevent these huge waves collapsing on top of each other and um, with the, with huge you know danger of I'm not going to say wipe us out, but at least inflict severe damage on our societies. And this all seems very far away. But as you saw last summer and also in previous summers and periods in the wintertime and in and, and autumn, that impact can be really, really severe. And they will become stronger and more impactful in the coming years and decades. So I think we have to sit back sometimes and see what, what can we do as citizens in order to try and contribute to the solution and of course uh, there's a lot of things that we can do we can maybe travel differently we could maybe consume differently perhaps eat less meat from time to time or do all kind of other actions in order to to help the planet but mostly it has to do with energy or energy use of course and the amount of fossil fuels that we burn still in order to uh, that feed this whole wave of co2 emissions in the air so one thing is that we can try to lower our emissions that's going to be essential to you know to create less peaks in the system at the same time we also have to mitigate as they call it to try to really address the problem and to draw down that carbon and see how we can try to suck as much carbon out of the air there's a lot of talk about very expensive installations or maybe compressing co2 and putting it back in in the soil, injecting it in old gas or oil wells, that kind of stuff. Um, machines that can take out CO2 and you know somehow lock it, lock it down. But there's of course a much better and easier solution and cheaper solution, which has a lot of benefits. And that is the tree. The tree is still the cheapest and most effective uh, carbon sequestering um, tool, if you like, available to us at this moment. So we, as a, as, 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 as a group of people very motivated to try and do something about this phenomenon, uh, decided to start a foundation. It's called the Life Terra Foundation. And we proposed a project to the European Commission three years ago and involving a consortium of 16 organizations from eight countries and try to create a very ambitious scheme or movement in order to try and motivate as many people as possible to get involved in planting trees. Now, um, it's not about a tree per se, of course, it's about really trying to reconnect to nature and restoring our traditional relationship with, with nature that we 
um, that perhaps in Romania, in, in lots of places, people still have that connection, but in many urban areas where people are more and more living, uh, that connection is sometimes forgotten or not valued as it, as it, as it was perhaps before. Um, now, tree planting force is not enough. We also have to monitor and see how the trees are doing. How, what can we learn from the plantings? How can we ensure that we have enough biodiversity? How can we help the kids, the new generation, to learn about climate change and what they can do about it? And so all these things are part of the Life Terra project. And we try to address that with, you know, developing education program for schools, um, building networks of volunteers that can help us to scale tree planting events. Um, we have an app developed in order to track, to geolocalize the trees and track them. So there's a lot of elements to this project. And um, we're very excited about the opportunities in order to grow. We, uh, we've been doing this for two year, two seasons, now in our third season. And the uptake is, is fantastic. We're planting uh, we're close to the first 2 million trees in our platform. And um, we are active now in 13 EU countries. So sorry, 13 European countries, because we're also planting in, in England, which is now not officially in more European Union. But in any case, um, we see Europe as, you know, the whole continent and um, very excited to also be in, in the UK because there's a big tree planting tradition there as well. So that's also very nice. We have very ambitious goals, as you can as you can see. We try to plant millions of trees. We are, we're never going to go in uh, within 2025 to reach 500 million trees. That's going to be very, very difficult. But in any case, it's sort of a long-term goal and we hope to to achieve that in who knows many years, but it all depends on you and on the citizens joining us and helping us out by becoming active in the field. So uh, how do our events look? I think if you've been to a tree planting event, you will recognize some of these pictures. These were some of these were taken still in during the pandemic. Um, we thought that probably it was better to be outside in nature than to be at home locked down. So we tried to get out as much as we could and plant trees. It involves a lot of children. We do a lot, a lot of projects with schools, um, but all kinds of collectives with companies, with sports people, sport teams. It doesn't matter. Anybody who's interested in planting, we try to invite them. And of course, um, our friends who've organized the event for today are the number one tree planting organization in Romania. So if you are interested in this, we really you know, promote and that you join them and at one of these plantings because it really gives fantastic energy. And this moment of planting trees is very magic to me. And um, we see that everybody comes home with this big smile on their face, enthusiastic about what they've done, what they've contributed to a better world. So what we offer is uh, really ambitious climate action. We invite in that sense, all kinds of stakeholders from different angles, it can be companies, can be collectives, can be schools. And we always try to start with perhaps one small project and try to build that out later to something bigger. In that sense, it's very important that we geolocalize the trees. So uh, our app is free of charge and, and any other tree planting event, organization, movement can use it. It's basically the idea is that by taking a picture of your tree, selecting the species that you just planted, th these are preloaded into the system, together with the GPS point of your phone, this tree is registered as a data point and you will be able to track it in the future and see how your tree, trees, how your trees are doing and if they are performing as expected. And then of course, once you have the first project, you can engage with the community and see how you can really make this project bigger and then you know go to different regions and expand it. And it since we're very happy also with our partners like Plantam in Fatibune to in order to expand into Romania. We do that with also in other countries with other parties, which gives us sort of much more speed in order to um, combine resources and, and go faster and give more visibility to this project because this is very important. Like I said, the geolocalization is a is a, is a key issue that we offer and um, you know, if you plant a few trees, it's nice to do. If you have, if you plant 100 trees on a one day, then it becomes a bit of a hassle, I admit it. But the idea is that it's very valuable to know what was planted, where and when. People will be able to have more information on the trees that they planted. So there's a 
sort of a link to the trees and you can also share them on social media as you can see on the right bottom uh, the fact that all these trees are geolocalized also gives information to the landowner about um, what was planted where and when like i said and we'll be able to track those trees in the future and that will add a layer of transparency to tree planting organizations and will give more trust from donors that want to support these projects financially in order to you know just say well, we planted 1000 trees or 10000 trees but then in the end not being able to justify where they are and so this is a system that will help um all organizations involved in this interested in this to give more transparency to their different stakeholders that they have okay and by the way uh, any questions please interrupt me uh, otherwise i just keep uh, rambling on all right good i'm curious so, then how, how many users are uh, registered in this application um that's a very good question we have i think something more than thirty thousand users now in this system uh, because basically everyone that participates with planting of trees um and and gets the login so it creates the login in order to to tag trees even if it's one can also be a few hundred but even if it's one we consider that a user and um so that's quite a, it's quite a big number of people yeah here on the right you see a what we call a company tree dashboard so this is a way for a corporate sponsor in this case uh Ernst and Young that uh, support us in many countries in Europe. They go and come with their teams to help plant and some projects they adopt and they allow schools to plant on their behalf. But at least you see here, they have 80,000 trees in our dashboard. And with this, they can say to their employees, to their shareholders, to all kinds of other um, social agents, where the trees are that they are supporting and how they're trying to create really a, an impact in Europe. So I think this is, uh, a good example of how people can be motivated in order to contribute this to this overall goal and um, we have all our dashboards are public so we're not hiding anything you it's very easy within our web page lifeterra.eu you can click to partners you can click on the respective links so we also try to prevent greenwashing there nobody can say that with thanks to life Terra, we are carbon neutral or these kind of things no we can only state how many trees you helped plant and that's the number and that's a very objective objective figure okay now i wanted to take the opportunity to discuss a theme that we are very excited about and that is um, urban projects so urban and peri-urban so in the surroundings of cities we feel that due to all this um, pollution that we sometimes see in cities because of traffic and because of industry <clears throat> sorry there's, and, and simply the, the the big amount of people and all and, and sometimes the lack of of green space um we see that there's a big trend in donors and people that are enthusiastic to see how they can make their cities greener now of course there's always a lack of space because people need to live there's schools there's uh all kind of other infrastructure necessary so there's always a fight between you know we want to plant trees but there is no space where do we do it and so the the example that i wanted to share with you today is from a city in the south of france called nice i'm not sure if you know it but um it's not a big city it's about 140,000 people more or less and um there was this parking lot sort of next to the city center that was abandoned a few years ago it was not really functional and Together with the city, we made a project in order to remove the concrete. It's really nice to see the concrete go out. And together with locals, we replanted that into a Miyawaki forest, which is a very dense type of forest, very um, with a lot of different species, in order to really, really uh, create this bit of an urban jungle, if you like, um, and to create to give also a huge boost to the local biodiversity. It was very important to involve there in such a project to involve the local community so there was a letter that went out to the neighbors the local school was invited to participate and we had kids and all kind of neighbors participating which is very nice young and old let's say so it's, it's very nice it gives us also the project a little bit more long-term support of course from the community and um we can 
as in all our projects, we geolocalize the trees, we publish drone information, etc., et on this planting. And I have a small video of it. I'm not sure if it's going to add it. That's the, the next slide. This is just a way for you to show how we calculate the, the carbon on such a project. So do we have an international panel of specialists that help us on species and geographic area to help us calculate how much carbon these trees and bushes will um, sequester in the coming 40 years. Our projects are typically 40 years long uh, in which we ask for commitment from the landowners. And with those 2,644 trees planted, we aim to capture between 600 and 800 tons of, of carbon in the community. It's not a lot, but it is a very small project, like I said, but for us, an interesting pilot because it was our first um, project with such a high density, what we call Miyawaki Forest. And um, yeah, we are excited about the reactions because people really like the idea. The area was completely mulched afterwards, which means that we put a lot of wood chips around the trees in order to prevent weeds coming growing up and also to retain a lot of water and humidity in the soil so it helps to to um yeah to create a healthy a healthy new forest now comes the challenging part i think here is oh no the video comes after this sorry <laughs> it's a long it's a long wait uh, this is uh, something that we also wanted to share with you guys this is a premiere we have not published this yet so you guys are the first ones to know we have um, certified this project for the first time for carbon credits uh, using the ASIS on-chain protocol, which is a alternative method from the established ones, which are very expensive. And this is a way in which we, uh, because we already geolocalize the trees, since we already have drone data, since we have already baseline studies on soil quality and, and all these matters, since we have a baseline study on biodiversity, we can very well justify the actions and prove how much carbon is going to be sequestered, uh, as well as how much biodiversity will be added, because we planted 12 different species that were not in that area, and that will attract new wildlife, insects, and, and etc. And therefore, we have, you see there, the first examples of four biodiversity credits, and also of one, uh, sorry, five, four carbon credits, excuse me, and also our first biodiversity credit. Now we have quite a bit of interest already from European companies that have to compensate legally their emissions or part of their emissions. And so the idea is that the, the more expensive these credits become in the future, the more incentive there will be for these companies to work towards net zero. So to, to look at their operations and see how they can travel less, produce more efficiently, prevent waste and all these factors in order to become more also to become less carbon intensive but of course any activity where we eat sleep drink uh, consume travel there's always going to be a production of, of co2 and therefore we allow then these companies to offset that and uh, for that they can buy these carbon credits and the interesting thing about this is that uh, we use blockchain in order to make these credits completely transparent and traceable and these certificates will be available as a, a unique nft therefore they cannot be altered and will be unique both to the buyer and also to the future sellers so there will be a complete traceability as to who owns the the, the, the rights of this carbon at this point okay and finally it's also uh, good for you to know um it's in in the parts below that we have Register this project also at the World Bank in the official carbon registry, which is an additional check and verification, um, sort of the global register where all the carbon projects are being notified. And that gives additional yeah, transparency and hopefully trust from buyers. So we are at the first step. Like I said, it's just it's recently out of the box. And uh, we hope to start commercializing that in order to gain more money for the foundation so we can plant more trees and um, involve more schools in order to help us plant and hopefully this is going to be a tool available also for our partners in order to um, to crack this market which is going to be potentially very interesting to help us finance our nature restoration projects okay and then finally here it is 
Uh, now let's see if it actually works. And I hope also that the sounds work, but at least there is subtitles. So if the sound doesn't work, because I always have these technical problems, at least you can see, get some a good impression of this project. It's only about two minutes, I think. So uh, bear with me. Okay, I'm not sure if you heard the sound, but yes, anyway. yes, yes, we, we can. You could hear the sound. Okay, wonderful that it worked. Good. Just to round off my presentation, um, as I said already a few times, we are supported by um, the European Commission. On the one hand, we have some co-funding from them, but we also depend a lot on donations. So we have individuals that support us by adopting trees on the website, um, but also we have a lot of corporate support. These are sometimes local companies, small companies that want to do something good for their local community, or sometimes also bigger bigger names that work across Europe. Um, and with some of them, we planned, I would say, with Ernst & Young, the biggest one already in 13 countries. So that's a really, really nice way of engaging their teams and to create a lot of, um, you know, positive vibes between colleagues around the issue of sustainability and climate action. As said, we also uh, work with the Commission, and so we have um, contacts with Indigenous Environment, Digi Klima, and other units. So, if ever you need help or you think you, yeah, you need to have something done there, at least try and contact us. We are always happy to to share contacts and see how we can help each other because the common goal is to get as many trees in the ground as possible, of course. And here you see an overview of our partners. We are, as I said, 16 partners from eight countries. We divide it among, spe among the, our specialties. So we have working groups on technology, trying to improve the tagging technology that I showed you, but also uh, how we monitor and how we incorporate satellite imagery into our, um, into our platform. We have, of course, implementation partners in the different countries that help us to plan and organize events. We have a few companies and uh, universities active in the education part to develop this um, program for kids between eight and 14 year old to learn about sustainability. And of course, we have a communication section where we try to get as much publicity and 
news for our events. We have newsletters. We have a very active YouTube channel. Uh, not yet TikTok. I'm learning that from some of the experts that you see here in the room. But uh, that will be something for the future. Anyway, um, just to, as, as my last slide, uh, I, I said this once at a conference last September where I was honored to, to also speak. I would say that one of the biggest problems or challenges of Europe is to find good locations. And so uh, I think you guys have a fantastic potential because I've driven around thanks to, to Mihai and Marine in, in lots of areas where you still have open spaces, where you have kilometers of uh, agricultural land. I'm not saying that we should convert all that to forest, but it would be very nice to have more hedges, to have more pockets of trees between that. It will really help biodiversity, uh, prevent erosion, do more around, uh, against floodings and help to retain water. So you also have incredible soils, not, not perhaps in, in all the regions. I've seen some very sandy soils as well, but in general, you have very good, good soils and, and, and a relatively temperate climate. Uh, I would say that compared to some countries, particularly in the West of Europe, um, you can plant very cost effectively in Romania, and it can also help to you know, regenerate again, new jobs for rural areas. So look at European support. There's a lot of money coming towards Romania, I think through the next gen funds and other, and other flows. And if you guys are interested in collaborating on carbon credits, biodiversity credits, as I showed, we'd be very happy to, to see how we can work together. So I think, um, yeah, you guys are in a quite unique opportunity to, uh, to contribute with a lot of trees to our overall goals. We're very happy to collaborate with, uh, with our friends and hope to come back many times in Romania. So, um, as I said, we have, we have the financial capacity to help co-finance trees and also planting. Um, the registration of the trees through the app is always free of charge available. And I'm, I hope and I'm sure that only together we can really uh, accelerate and achieve massive climate action. So that's my story. Uh, these are my trees. I have a few in Romania, so that's very nice. And uh, I hope to have many more in the future. This is my contact. Look me up on LinkedIn or anywhere else and uh, be glad to, to stay in touch with you. Thanks very much and open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Zun, for your wonderful presentation. I agree with your proposal, let's say, regarding the potential of Romania. I also think that we still have a great potential to grow the forest area across Romania, but also in other several countries across Europe. So I know also that there are a lot of money in the sector. All we need is to identify the lands, to produce seedlings, saplings, and to plant them. About samplings, I saw several photos in your presentations with protected roots, potted samplings. This is uh, the way you are planting always, or you are also using uh, samplings with better roots? What is the main, the percentage, let's say? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say the exact percentage, but it depends a lot on the country. For example, in Spain, where we have very dry conditions, we almost always plant with um, with a root ball. While in the Netherlands, we plant a lot with uh, bare root, for example. So, uh, because the soil is quite uh, clayish and holds a lot of water, it's more, much more wet, and so there we can plant easier with with bare root. Also in Germany, we plant a lot with bare root. Uh, UK as well. So it depends, I think, a little bit on the temper, um, on the climate, on the local climate conditions, and on the availability of nurseries, of course. Uh, but you see that in Spain, for example, there's very little bare wood being planted. In France, it's a mix, depending also where you are. So in that sense, it depends a lot. I couldn't give you the exact percentages, but we try, of course, to, to do the best that's available and also what's the most cost-effective uh, seedling that we can get. Do you have partnership with nurseries or are you planning to develop also some own nurseries? No, we're not in the nursery business uh, ourselves. We, uh, one of the biggest nurseries in Spain is a partner, one of the partners of Life Terra. So that's a natural sourcing for us. They produce around 12, between 12 and 13 million trees per year. 
So that's a very good way for us to get access to a lot of plants. But then in all the other countries where we are active, we have relationships, we're building relationships with nurseries and um, often uh, indicated by the landowner who has already a relationship with them. And that is simply helps us to amplify the, the, um, the offer and, and, and be able to, to find the most competitive prices and the best quality for these, for these seedlings. Um, I would say that this, this sector is quite in development. You see that there's a technification going on uh, where higher production because lower costs is, is being made. Also because Europe is expecting to plant really not just millions per year, but tens and potentially hundreds of millions of trees. So it means that this sector will also have to evolve and to create um, much higher quantities of trees in the future. Then also to, to um, in, in, in follow up to your question, also to say that we are now going to test for the first time seeding, direct seeding of seeds that are pre-germinated as a way to um, one, one project in uh, the south of Spain, um, which is going to be done in a few weeks and one in France. And if, if you guys in Romania are interested, we'd be happy to also uh, to do that because we feel that um, if maybe to plant a tree, including the seedling and all the work, could cost maybe two or three euros. Um, I, I don't know how much that is in, uh, in, in, in Romanian currency, but uh, we could probably do that by planting the seed for 20, 30 cents, even if we plant two seeds to see which one germinates better. So we could create probably forests at a much faster speed and with a much lower cost. So if we really have to create massive new forests and there is space available, that could be an alternative way of planting that, um, yeah, it depends a lot, of course, on also on uh, the presence of wild boars or other animals that could distort this type of planting. So you have to think about maybe protection or maybe do some extra seeds in order to allow for uh, a percentage of, um, of failures. But we're looking at all these different methods to see, um, yeah, to have, let's say, a menu of options, basically, because I, I do not believe in one solution. Uh, that's probably not, there is no one solution. There's probably something will work better here and something else will work better there. And so we have to have this whole be open and uh, experiment as much as we can and learn what are the most effective techniques. We're very eager to try it also. We have also experience in Romania in uh, creating new forests from seeds. It was the case, for example, in some places for the oaks, which okay. is a big problem nowadays in Romania because the oaks are fruiting very one at five or one at ten years so it's a big challenge to have the needed quantity of seeds uh -huh. so maybe it would be also a good idea you mentioned also about the educational branch of life terra i'm very curious if you can could provide us additional information for example would, would it be possible to build together or to adopt also in Romania what you develop? I mean, by translating the materials or is it also available online or something like this? Yes, the um, the education package that we have an official name for it, which is called Terra Mission. It's available in seven languages, uh, not yet in Romanian, but uh, in English, in German in um, Spanish, right, the typical languages of the of our partners that are active in the project. Uh, it's going to be available in French as well very soon. Um, that's free of charge, available to any school teacher interested. There's also a MOOC, sort of how to train the, te train the teachers or teach the teacher, as they say. Uh, it's very accessible and very interactive for kids to play with. They learn about um, 10 themes, including climate change, of course, and tree planting but also about regenerative agriculture, uh, about the energy transition, about circular economy, and um, the water cycle. So these are all transversal themes that sometimes they hear about, maybe in geography or in other courses. And, um, but this is sort of transversal, informing them about, you know, quite objectively, uh, it's STEM-based, so it's really um, taking into account. There's lots of people from universities and research institutes that look at that, you know, to give as objective as possible the opinions, but also to come with solutions. And the fact that it's very interactive means that kids can play 
either um, with the computer or together with their friends and propose things also for their uh, own community you know to be done about, against it so right now it's only available like i said in those seven languages so if you have any school that is already maybe teaching certain courses in english or in other other languages it would be easy for them to adopt and um if i would just like to invite everybody it's free of charge go to our website lifeterra.eu look for uh, education and terra mission you can play around with it and if you like it we can of course always look at to see if we can maybe um, um, help translate it into other languages and uh, publish it in in uh, yeah, whatever language is necessary so we have had now more than 10,000 teachers already using it so it's just, uh, basically we were kind of scared At the beginning we, we we did a test with 150 teachers to see how they liked it and um, basically 148 completed it so this was a good sign and then we opened it up in the second year we had a few hundred people looking at it and then the, the last year we were completely you know bombarded with requests so apparently this, this is something that is really there's a big demand for uh, there's apparently not a lot of good good sources or good material available to teachers uh, it's only 10 hours and they can divide it up in blocks depending on the time available in the school so they can do it in uh, in a week, or they can do it in three months. It doesn't matter. And uh, what at the end, what we promise as Life Terror is that we will help, try to see if we can help together with partners uh, to also realize an offline tree planting. So the programs, of course, can be given on the on the whiteboard, on the electronic whiteboard, or through the internet. And so, particularly in the COVID times, it was important for kids to be able to connect to the platform, to be able to connect, uh, and then afterwards, we hope to bring the class out in nature. And let them uh, let them loose and plant some trees. So to have also an offline component. Of course, that is not always possible because to 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 arrange that for ten thousand classes is really a daunting task. But we try to accommodate as many schools as we can. Thank you. It surely sounds interesting, and we will uh, you will be hearing. Uh from us more about the subjects. I wanted to, to go back to some history and ask you at first, why a pan-European project? So you talked to us about the European Commission and their part in, uh, in the development of Life Terra, but I wanted to ask you why all over Europe, and not only Europe probably in the future, and uh, why not just in Netherlands or Spain for that yes. matter? <laughs> why did you want it to go internationally that's an excellent question um as i said maybe at the beginning i was i was born in the netherlands lived there happily for about 20 years and then i was able to study in quite a few places in uh, in the world and eventually settled in in barcelona and so i feel i don't feel dutch i don't feel spanish i don't i feel european i like to say so and i think that together we are stronger we've had a very um, turbulent and bloody past but i only think working together and appreciating each other's cultures can we move forward and create a, a nice world to, that's to live in so i saw a lot of tree planting initiatives in spain others in portugal everybody trying to reinvent the wheel and i'm not saying that we are better at all but by just trying to cooperate with other people we can learn a lot from each other and one of the fantastic examples is uh, our klima we didn't talk about it but our climate forests and you guys were interested, for example, to adopt or to receive uh, Spanish trees that have particular resilience, resistance to drought and to late frost to see if we can plant those in Romania to test them against the challenges that we're facing of long summers without rain. Um, because what are we going to plant? You know, That's a big question. Should we plant the same as always, the trees that are suffering already and almost dying because of drought? Or should we try something else? And if we try something else, what should we try? And, and so the fact that you guys are open and we're doing the same in France, we're doing the same in the Netherlands, in Germany, in small projects to see if maybe sequoia trees or certain cedar trees or other um, oaks that come from Southern Provenance that can maybe live with 30% less water, if they have a chance in, the, in, 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 in other countries, it would be, I think, a wonderful addition to really create this you know european project so that's why uh, coming in with the european spirit let's say and also the fact that i see a lot of possibilities to collaborate and to 
exchange and learn, I think it's worth that we uh, we give this a try. I mean, together we are really stronger, and uh, you don't feel so alone in, in doing this. So hopefully, more people will join this. And how did you find partners? That's the second uh, question related to the first one. How yeah, did you yeah, find yeah. Partners. In well, I, I started. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very good question. Also, it is. Um, I started my first life project because I was uh, in in two thousand eight. So that's a long time ago, and there we only did it in the regional. So we had some partners from Spain, some from Barcelona, some from Valladolid, and from other areas, and uh, one Dutch guy that I knew. So okay, that was nice. But now Europe is more and more demanding that these type of projects are presented internationally. So with cross country collaboration. So now we are 18 live projects later. And so in that, in those 18 projects, we've um, made a lot of friends in, in Portugal, in Italy, in, in Germany, in different countries. So from the, all those partners, we try to pull the ones that were most related to this subject together. And that's why we presented, we were able to present such a big consortium. Um, so it has a bit of a history behind it. A lot of these people in the, in the consortium are already friends. And uh, due to a lack of time, we're not 32 partners because we could have chosen many more other other organizations to join this. Uh, but there was simply a lack of, lack of time to do that. It was, we wrote this in, in a few months, this proposal, which was very uh, one of the biggest climate uh, mitigation projects in Europe um, approved by the commission. So it was, it was quite a bit of a task. But anyway, to, to come back to the question, it's basically uh, a matter of having worked together with a lot of international uh, organizations that has brought us to the life there which is our biggest and hopefully also our last project because it, it takes up a lot of energy um, and then a, a recommendation if ever you want to go into life or in any other european co collaboration we are now working in this together with companies universities research institutions ngos associations so there's really a variety of stakeholders in there which makes the project much more attractive to brussels and also to, um, I think, between our, between us, we are very different. And therefore, um, we really can add value. And if it's all companies or all universities, there's a different dynamic. And it will focus more on a particular aspect. And I think we need multidisciplinary and uh, people from different cultures and different ideas in order to really try and tackle this. So try to go as broad as possible if you can. Thanks. Uh, in talking about challenges, despite everything that you uh, told us to, uh, in the last few minutes, which uh, they even that might seem like a lot of challenges already for, for you, how did you see planting in uh, Southern Europe, planting in North Spain and then in Netherlands, in other regions? What were the challenges and uh, what were the things that you, you've you seen that uh, can be done uh, in all of these places? And what are the particularities? And how do you see all, all this movement for uh, climate action and uh, planting trees all, all over Europe? Okay, having well, this, uh, <laughs> let's say, larger perspective on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very uh, challenging question because it has a lot of elements in there. I mean, even within the Netherlands, which is a very small country, as you know, I think Romania is 10 or 11 times bigger than, than the Netherlands. So imagine how small the Netherlands is. Uh, we see very different realities in the north, in the south, but also in the more parts next to the sea and in the, in the east, more close to Germany. I'm talking about soil types, tree types, but also the mentality of the people. Imagine that it's a very small country, but they're quite different in the West than they are in the East. So how do you start? How do you get in there? Um, if only the Netherlands already shows so much diversity, how will it be in Europe? Well, I can tell you it is really down in the end to personal relationships. So it is a lot of calling, visiting, um, establishing trust, doing small pilots, learn from each other and then say, okay, how can we go from a thousand trees to 5,000 or 10,000 trees? How can we go from five projects to 50 projects? And um, as an example, we have been working with some landowners in Portugal, for example, that we said that we planted 5,000 trees 
in the first year and the, the second year we sent them 25,000 trees because they really trust us now and they plant them to themselves with their own community. So that's a way for us to scale up in order to not be dependent on us at the time going to a particular place because that makes it, of course, not viable. We can we will always do the same volume every year and we the hope is that we can really accelerate this and uh, empower other people and organizations to do it also. So, um, yeah, the reality is is very different per country, inside the country itself. And um, uh, there's also a big difference between public and private landowners, as you know. Um, public landowners, for example, in France are notorious. They take a lot of time before they give you a permit. But then we met this enthusiastic uh, mayor in Nice that has said, I'm pledging one tree for each inhabitant. inhabitant. So all the newborns get a tree in their name. All the citizens should get the opportunity to plant their trees. So if you find persons like that or you read about in the news that are willing to do something differently, they're willing to step it up, then those are the first ones you should contact and they will give you, they will give you momentum and they will give you publicity. And that helps a lot to, to get going, basically. Because as always, you need one example uh, or one proof that you can do a particular type of project and then more will follow. So in that sense, it is basically trying trying again and there's a lot of failure and learnings on the way but that's i guess part of life so uh, in that sense uh, but but coming back to the sort of general general question there is more so the biggest challenge is probably finding land and and money uh, to 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 plan for it but the actual planters that is the least of our problem literally if you you raise your finger or you put a, 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 an announcement on Facebook or any other channel. Hey, we have a planting next Saturday or in two Saturdays in Den Bosch or in close to Bordeaux or doesn't matter. People will come. There is this huge demand from citizens that feel very, I don't know how to say it, but they feel very insecure or afraid of climate change or well, let's say of the situation of, in which we are no there's a war going on there's this flooding there's there's drought there is all these all these tensions in society in general and to be able to go out and plant the trees is a very simple task in the end but gives a great satisfaction and so uh, it is a matter of trying to to establish um access to all these locations and then i'm sure we'll be able to you know one of our dreams is that at some point on the Saturday, on a certain Saturday, I always give that example. We all step out as, as Europeans with our tree, you know, young and old, and we all plant our tree in our in our community. That if we sort of roughly speak, could we could be 500 million people, you know, thinking big, including our friends in Ukraine uh, or part of our, part part of the countries around us, and we would all go out on the Saturday morning and plant our tree, and then we would have this massive impact. It's, of course, a dream, and uh, people will call me crazy, uh, which they do regularly, which is fine, but it is not impossible. Yeah, It's very difficult to achieve, but it's not something impossible. You could you could see yourself do that, and um, so it's a matter of trying, pushing, and continue that, that, um, that effort in order to, to get more and more people involved. I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, Maureen, but uh, at least I tried. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, if we start talking now about all the challenges everyone has faced trying to plant trees and organize a tree planting campaign, probably probably we will have to have another discussion, Correct. Uh, particularly on this. I have only one last question. You answered it already, at least in some percentage, but I want to, to say it loud. Um, why? I have why two young kids. Do you do this? Why do you do this? Yeah. And why all of you, I mean, Life Terra, do this? Mm. Um, I have two young kids. Um, and to be very honest, I was very worried already for many, many years about the state of the world. So I, I, I really postponed having kids. And when I really got them in the end, I was super happy with them and very proud of them. But I'm also very worried about their future. So that is really one of my biggest drivers to, to really try and enforce this and you know, people will consider you a bit of a nuisance. Um, we have in the Netherlands, for example, this crazy situation in which people that are protesting against climate change, they, they are locked up in prison. 
locked up in prison for protesting peacefully against, uh, you know, big polluters, for example, while other people uh, are um, are not being treated like that. So there's 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 a lot going on. I think that there, there, this change in society is happening, and we are we, as I say, the Life Terror team, together with you guys, with all our partners in Europe, we are in this position that we can do something. I mean, it's not the solution, but we can hopefully contribute to the solution. And I think we uh, we have a moral responsibility to try and take that and make the best of it. And within the team, we have a lot of young people, uh, younger than me, I should say, and they're all very driven by, let's say, the heart and the love of trees. And so you see this incredible enthusiasm and, and we feed off the energy also of people. So when we do events and people, you know, they thank you or they... You see them walking away with a smile. You see them interacting with their kids or with their with their friends. That gives us the energy that you know that we are onto something that is very valuable to them and to society. So hopefully that motivates us to continue and to uh, to build us out to something really big. Thank you. Uh, Mihai, if you have a last question or another question for Sven. It's not actually a question. I think your message was very clear and very engageable, let's say. <clears throat> I do think that the, your target by planting 5 million trees is a big challenge, but not impossible. I We tried also, or other colleagues tried to have a one day in National Planting Day. There are a lot of challenges. But nowadays, to the, due to the developings in our nurseries across Europe, by producing more and more protected um, simplings with protected roots, from my point of view, the main benefit consists in the fact that uh, we can plant for several weeks during spring or autumn mainly. In some cases, in some areas, maybe also during summer, but we need a lot of water, so it's very, very challenging. So, who knows, Sven, maybe in 10 or 20 years, we will have that great movement. But all steps are very, very important, and what you are doing together with your colleagues across Europe is a very good example. We want to be a part of it. We are very engaged also in our country. And from my point of view, I'm very sure that as much as many people are involved in this movement, it will be greater for all of us. So that would be my last message, let's say. And I want to thank you once again for your presentation. I'm looking forward to send us several segues to test them in Romania. Thank you. Thank you, Zen. Wonderful. I think you you hit it on the nail. So you you you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, this is exactly what we should try and aim for in order to collaborate together. And hopefully it will be not in 20 years, but sooner. But indeed, we, we have this uh, opportunity, this window of opportunity to, to still act and try to reverse this. So I think we should grab it. And uh, like you say, we are also very happy with our collaboration and this wonderful friendship that we've established. I had never been to Romania. It was on my bucket list, as they say. And uh, you guys make it happen. So I feel very welcome. And we hope to do this also in Bulgaria and in other countries in, in Central Europe. And um, we're going to be planting in April in Hungary, for example, with some very enthusiastic landowner moving from traditional agriculture to an agroforestry project. So there's, it is happening in Europe. It is, and, and so we, we want to be part of that, of that movement. So thanks again for inviting me. It is a pleasure. I'm always open for any questions, any ideas, as crazy as they sound. We we'll listen to them and see if we can help uh, with the ideas, money, or at least energy or smile. <laughs> Thank you as well, Svan. And thank you to all of you that uh, were together now or that uh, with us, or all of you that will see the recording here on Facebook or on YouTube on or other platforms. Have a very nice uh, evening. And of course, see you soon with other live conferences here on our Facebook page. Thank you. <laughs>